is it, Sagan? Um, 2016. 2016. It's a new year, is yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, and we're back for mailbag, aren't we? Yeah. Awesome. Let's get into it. You wanted to start with this little one, didn't you? Yeah. Because we've got a couple of big ones, but you want the little one first. Yeah, this Why? one first. Because I don't know what's inside it. Well, that's as good enough reason as any. So, Happy New Year to everyone watching. Say Happy New Year, Sagan. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> You're silly. All right, this one is from none other than Jack Gensel. Everyone knows Jack. Good day, Jack. He uh, dropped by the lab last year. And if you haven't seen the video, oh, what have you been doing? Um, yes, we sat down and chatted for, I don't know, was it? An hour or something about uh, embedded electronics. Jack Gensel is the embedded guru. So what's he sent? Let's have a look what Jack sent. <gasps> what's this? A new mug. A new mug. It's the embedded muse. There you go. That's Jack's uh, uh, embedded newsletter. Look. Okay, this... Oh, I think that was all blurry because it was focusing on Sagan's face, wasn't it? Look. A letter. What does it say? Here we go, let's have a look. Dave, we're finally back from Australia, New Zealand, and a grueling five days in Hawaii. Jeez, must be tough. Um, I really enjoyed meeting you and doing the show together. Have an awesome I have an awesome setup here. Thank you very much. Um, and do keep in touch. Meanwhile, here's a caffeine enclosure. It's a caffeine enclosure. It's and uh, Jack Gansel, it's gansel.com. So there you go, the embedded muse. Sign up for Jack's embedded newsletter. Lots of wisdom in there. There you go. Say thanks, Jack. Hi, Jack. You playing DeLoreans? Um, All right, you want to open the next one? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. It's a big one. Thank you very much, Chris Bowden. You might know the name. Uh, he found the founder and uh, runs the uh, the Geek Group uh, Makerspace in Grand Grand Rapids in Michigan. Never been to Michigan. Uh, it's a huge makerspace if you haven't seen it, and they do tons of videos and teardowns and all sorts of maker and hacker stuff and he sent something in hasn't he Sagan? it's yeah. big and heavy so it cost a lot thank you very much chris and uh uh he i believe he sent one to me and well definitely sent one to me and to uh fellow uh, blogger um ave as well so i haven't checked ave's channels like we just got back from holidays didn't we Sagan? yeah we just hung out on the beach didn't we that was fun all right, let's see what he sent. I have actually watched a video where he actually uh, packed, or he showed this before he actually uh, sent it, but I don't know what it is. He didn't actually say what it is. He just gave a glimpse of it. And so let's uh, let's have a squeeze. It's a mystery item, as are all mailbags, but you know, this one comes from Chris, so it's gonna be interesting. And I'm not wearing my Geek Group T-shirt today. Oh, it's got handles. It's got handles. Hang on. It's got a tag. It's got a tag. What does the tag say? Oh, computer. Oh, no, let's let's save. Let's have a look. Sorry, this one could require some effort. So here we go. Looks military. Definitely military. I'll put the box where you put that. Okay. You hold onto the box. This ain't working too well. Here we go. Let's get rid of some of the bubble wrap. Yeah, I love bubble wrap. Bubble wrap's great, isn't it? Yeah, we can pop it later. Ta-da! Look! A, oh, another T-shirt! Awesome! Another T-shirt for you. Let's see if it fits. Let's see if it fits. Oh. It, it fit. Does it fit? It fit. I assume it's a geek group. It's plain blue. Oh, no, no. It's got the geek group down the bottom there. There's go, a very faint geek group. So I guess that's very arty. Thank you very much, Chris. Excellent. Blue is good, isn't it? Yeah. Daddy needs different colours. Mummy always complains about Daddy wearing bland colours, yeah? yeah? All right. So, what is this thing? What is it? It's been beat up. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's been painted. It's painted black. It's not anodized. It's painted. And... We've got some military style connectors on it. Still got one of the original caps. So, oh, I don't know. Closer look required. Interesting, isn't it, Sagan? What do you think's inside? Don't know. I don't, I don't think 
it opens. You don't think it opens? Well, actually, that's one. No, I think no. There is some screws on the top, so hopefully the lid comes off. So really interesting. Pacer Jim save list. What does that mean? But look, that is all glued to there. See? Yeah, it's welded. Yep. Yeah, it's welded. But oh, yeah. I don't know. I hope it comes off because I'm not really equipped here to open mechanical workshop wise to open something like this. So, so hmm. it doesn't open, does it? I think there's a power. I think there's a power plug. There's a power plug. Well, that would be one of the ports on the front, wouldn't it? Yeah. Look, we've got various multi-pin ports. J something or other. Okay. And that. And that. That just looks like a big nut in the middle. So I'm not sure what's going on, whether or not it's designed to be pressurised for some reason, but it's it's interesting. I think it's a toy to play with. A toy to play with. Everything's a toy on mailbag. Yeah, yeah. let's go. And this one will definitely be saved for a teardown Tuesday. And I actually uh, googled this and I think I know what it is. Well, it actually tells you down on the plate too. Check it out. It's an automatic Astro Compass Type MD1. Thank you very much. Um, well, it might have been upgraded to MD3, is it? But uh, the label here says MD1. Anyway, this is an analog computer uh, uh, from uh, Colesman Instrument Corporation in the US. Thank you very much. Um, I did a bit of uh, uh, looking on this thing, and it, I believe it's from a B52 Strato Fortress Bomber. It's the uh, basically the analog computer that's hooked up to the automatic uh, uh, sextant, which does the you know star tracking and um, uh, navigation, part of the inertial navigation system on a B-52 bomber. Fantastic! And it comes from an Air Force base in uh, Utah, and of course they're still running uh, B-52s on, you know, airframes like built back in the 50s, I think, or, you know, 60s at uh, uh, best. Anyway, this one that dates from 1983, so they're still using, uh, they're probably still using these puppies on B-52s now, perhaps. I don't know, although they switched over to uh, GPS and everything, maybe, you know, but, ah. Uh, Geez, these were used for a long time. Anyway, it's an analog computer. Definitely do a separate teardown for this puppy. And there you go. There's the original United States Air Force uh, tag for this thing. Condition code B. I don't know. Um, 20th of November 1985. That's when they probably took it out of uh, service or did whatever. I don't know if it's working or it you know, failed, whatever. I don't know. Anyone in the United States Air Force can tell us what any of that claptrap means? So thank you very much, Chris Bowden, for sending this one in. Definitely a very interesting Teardown Tuesday coming up. And I'll link in the Geek Group's uh, website down below. Check them out. And they've got a YouTube channel and everything else. They do an absolute ton of stuff. Check them out. Thanks, Chris. But hang on. As for getting this thing apart, I see four screws here. Flathead screws, but you know what is this? Some sort of, as I said, like does the, is this thing being uh, pressurized or something like that? Anyway, is this some sort of uh, uh, vent or something? Pressure vent? I'm not entirely sure, but the uh, the screws do go down to check it out. Like they go down to here, so I've, like they just painted that on, or is it like welded closed? Am I going to have to like get the grinder out and open this thing up? I don't know. Hmm. Could be tricky. Woohoo! We've got another one, Sagan. It's huge. It's from Germany. Hi to all my German viewers. Say hi to, hi to everyone in Germany. Hi everyone in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> That's silly. All right. Let's open it up, yeah? Yeah, let's And uh, it comes from, uh, sorry, uh, Sven Stuhl. I can't pronounce the last name. Stulti? Sorry. Goof that one up, but let's see what Sven has sent. And well, I know what it is, but I don't know what type. So it's heavy, so thank you very much. Would have cost a packet to send. Would have cost an absolute packet. Ooh. And lots of paper. Lots of paper. So what is it that was sent this time? You're, you're definitely right, Daddy. It's an. Woo! It's an oscilloscope! Old school! Yay, Sagan! Hey, we knew it! We knew oh, it. and it's got that old school smell. 
smell it. Smell it. Smells 1970s, Sagan. Yeah, yeah. 1970. 1970s oscilloscope. All right, I'll come back when I've got it out. What brand is it? I've never seen it. It's an RFT. No idea. It's an EO, RFT EO213 analog oh, scope. Look at that. Uh, I want to see what's that. Let me see what that is. It's a 230V. It's a 230 two volts. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's 230V. 230 volts main. Yeah. So that means we can plug it directly in and see if it works. I've got no idea. Um, oh, there's a couple of. Another couple of boxes in here. Yeah. Wonder what's in. If there's anything in those, or they're just padding, or something like that. But it's in pretty good nick, Sagan. Yeah. And what are those two? Uh, there. That's TV mode. And there's your horizontal time base. Here's your vertical controls. There's your vernier. You know all about verniers, don't you? Yeah. And then there's chop mode and alt. You don't get that in your modern oscilloscopes, do you? No, you only get it on these analog CRT ones. It's a Bobby Dazzler, Sagan. Yeah. And they're ganged switches. That means when you push one in, the other one comes out. And they're what? Well, they, they, that selects all your different operational modes. But they're ganged because you can't have both modes on at once. That's why the switches are ganged. And this is the on button. It is the on. It, that is the power button. But what's inside these? Yeah, come on, let's open it. Open it. All right. But you never know your luck in the big city, do you, Say? No. We never know what's inside our Mario bags because there's so many. No, it's more padding. More padding. More padding. No, it's just extra padding, Say again. There you go. Because when you're shipping stuff like this, you have to protect the controls, don't you? Yeah, although it did have some um, a nice, I presume it's not original uh, foam, packing foam. But yeah, it's important to put extra padding on front of the controls. And it got here in good nick. No, definitely nothing, right? No, nothing. Just empty box. You found a probe, didn't you say again? Yeah. Is it for a multimeter or an oscilloscope? I think it's for a oscilloscope. A oscilloscope. Can you say oscilloscope? Oscilloscope. Good boy. I got it right. Yeah. I've got an EO213 oscilloscope. Well, does that, it looks like service manual. Schematics. Win. It's all, um, it looks like it got wet. Let it go. Ah! Quick, save me. Good work. Smile. Since my amateur radio club got a new Rigold DS1052. Jeez, that's a bit old school. Ah, uh, we, that's all right though. Nothing wrong with it was produced in Germany about 30 years ago. Doesn't know when this particular one was being produced, but found documents from 1982. Never seen an East German brand on the blog. There you go, it is something different. Um, uh, would have been around 10,000 East German marks at the time. Oh, I have no idea if that's a lot of money. Um, hope this monster puppy came in one piece. It looks like it came in one piece. But yeah, as I said, I think it all got a bit wet. Hmm. What a bummer. He briefly tested it, but didn't send the power plug. It wouldn't fit in Australia. Anyway, have fun. Thank you very much, Sven. Beauty. This is one unusual puppy that Sven sent in here. Look, at it's got like an acrylic uh, front panel. The entire front panel, where, you know, silk screened on the, uh, is it the front side or the back side? I think it's the back side. And, or it might have an overlay behind that, but basically an acrylic front panel and <laughs> Really old school stuff. I mean, wow, look at this thing. Uh, dual channel, uh, from what I gather from the specs here, uh, dual channel 10 megahertz. So, you know, it's not going to set the world on fire. Never heard of this RFT brand, but hey, that's not surprising. It probably never left uh, Europe, never uh, uh, sold anywhere else, but uh, I stand to be corrected. But yeah, it's a basic old school. I wouldn't have thought that they were still manufacturing this in the 80s but you know because it's got like a, a early to mid 70s kind of look and feel to it really but 
Um, yeah, or maybe late seventies. But hey, you know, we're talking about uh, East Germany before the fall of the uh, wall. So yeah, you know, um, maybe using like you know Soviet era. Uh, tech or something like that, perhaps? Not entirely sure, but... And I know I'm supposed to uh, take it apart first before I turn it on, but I can't help myself. Anyway, um, Sven says it's uh, 230 volts, so... We got a red lead. Will take time. It will take time. Here we go. Come on. Where's our beam? Give us our beam. Oh. No beam. Not a sausage. Oh, no, no, there it is. There it is. Yay! Kind of, sort of works. It's intermittent. You touch, oh, yeah. Oh, it's a bit how you doing. Woohoo, check it out. We're getting something. Channel B seems to uh, work better than Channel A. We're using the old school probe. Oh, my goodness. Look at the <laughs> banana plug. But, hey, it's got a banana plug on the front for the cow signal. It's all, it's completely dicky. It needs a new, uh, oh, yeah, look look at the vernier there. Yeah, it needs a good, uh, needs a good clean. But uh, it's not, we haven't got a 50% duty cycle on that puppy, but... Uh, it's kind of, sort of, working. It's all there, you know, the vertical and the horizontal is there. So, yeah, that's... Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. That's a nice, sharp trace. Jeez. That's a Bobby Dazzler, actually. Look at that. Wow, that's a super fine trace. Haven't seen one that fine since the old, uh, you know, Hitachi uh, V212s. That's a real nice, sharp trace. But, of course, uh, the bezel actually fell off. This is what it's supposed to look like. There we go. So you can put your oscilloscope camera on there. Yeah, no worries. Oh, sh single shot scope. Just, yep, turn your camera on. And we've got ourselves an easy access rear panel. Oh, check it. Unfortunately, the rest of it is not uh, as easy access. Um, looks like you can't get the side panels off until you take, like, the whole frame a part or whatever, so that's rather annoying. Anyway, we've really got some uh, crusty business happening on the back of this uh, PCB here. Not seeing a day code. Got some genuine bodges down there. Look at those. They're really caked into the dust and the crud on this thing. It almost looks like they're just oh, like swimming in a sea of crud. Oh, Look at the uh, old school wiring here. It's all... Uh, uh, lashed together in a bundle, very neat and tidy, sort of like a tag strip uh, type, well, t you know, tag strip type uh, turrets on here, soldered on, and uh, just a single side of board, there's our bridge rectifier, our, there's some filter caps down in here, which you might not be able to see, we've got a, uh, looks like the main uh, regulation, well, yeah, that's all coded. Look at it. Uh, main pass transistor in there. It's got discrete wiring going over. You can see some heat sinks down there on some metal cam packages and a couple of PCB mount fuses. Bob's your uncle. And we'll just prop it up here on the old 28 Series 2 that I beat the crap out of. Why not? And we've got some more bodginess happening in here on the back of uh, what looks like to be the uh, vertical board in here. And geez, look at some of this crustiness. Unbelievable. Wow. These are obviously the front end vertical amps and attenuators. Look at all the trimmer caps in here. Wow. Unbelievable. And our main, uh, yep, there we go. That's our main uh, vertical attenuator control. But that one is the vernier. You can see it turned at the back. Neat. So there's our pot on the back for the vernier. And you'll notice all the uh, high voltage wire in here. Not, still nicely all lashed together. Look at that. Geez, somebody knew what they were doing. Anyway, there's the high voltage uh, warning stickers on the back there because, of course, this is the uh, focus and the intensity uh, controls. And they're all going right back into the high voltage can under here, which we won't have time to access. And, of course, we've got our uh, filament driver uh, and uh, other stuff on the back of the CRT there. And there's the bottom of that power supply board for you power supply aficionados. Look at the lovely little heat sinks there on those metal can packages, and that's all just bodged in. Oh my goodness, they've got a tab under there going to the center pin of that transistor. Unbelievable. 
And the chassis is just uh, pretty awful. I mean, this top cover, for example, was just held on with these two screws here. So everything else, like around the outside, is just flapping in the breeze. Unbelievable. And we've got the full service manual for this thing. There's all the block diagram. I won't go through it all, but there it is. A pretty much all discrete uh, transistor with some, you know, a basic, you know, they're going to have some maybe 4000 series uh, CMOS. What are they? I don't know, you know, TTL, something like that. Nothing uh, particularly fancy at all. And... Yeah, we've even got like component overlays, everything. Fantastic. I might have to uh, scan these in actually and link them in down below. There's all the uh, uh, horizontal uh, selection. And for those who can read German, go for your life. Uh, bandwidth looks like, as I said, uh, about 10 megahertz. Well, is that guaranteed? Vertical at minus 3 dB, 12 megahertz? <laughs> oh, screaming. So thank you very much, Sven, for sending that one in. Uh, two minute uh, teardown was a bit longer than that. Sorry about that. Oh, this is going to be a long mailbag, I suspect. Anyway, um, I would love to keep this on the bench, but I don't have room for it. So any old analog uh, aficionados out there, and uh, beginners. Um, if anyone wants this, I'll um, certainly pass it along, along with the uh, service manual as well. Uh, half decent beginner's scope. There you go. Nice newfangled digital rubbish. Um, Australia only. So the first person in Australia, let me know and I'll ship this puppy to you. Thanks, Sven. Look, Dad, I would open that one on the shelf there. The next biggest one? Yeah, the next biggest one. All right. Uh, it's a medium one. A medium size mailbag, yeah? Yeah, medium size. Let's do it, dude. Yeah, I can get this one. All right. You take away the rag. I'll take it. Here we go. All right. Don't start without me. Don't start without you, okay? Here we go. Yeah, I didn't clean up the mess. Sorry about that, but let's go do it, yeah? Yeah. This one is from... It's from Australia. It's from Matt. G'day, Matt. Um, he's from Western Australia. I know all my Western Australian viewers. All right, let's have a look. What do you think it's going to be? I don't know. You, th you think it's going to be working or not working? Working. Working? I think so. Okay. All right, what's Matt sent? Lots of things. Lots of things. Whoa. Whoa. More Sony. We've got another Sony Walkman. I, I do have a collection of Sony stuff. That is, no. it's an Apple. Somebody has sent one of those, have they not? Look. Wow. Look at this. It's a 5 watt transistor CB radio. Wow. Look at this. Nice big telescopic antenna. Oh, look at that puppy. Look how long that is, Sagan. Yeah. Look. That's about a meter and a meter and a half long. Here's a different oh, one. Oh, beauty! Yeah, it doesn't tell you how many transistors. That was a big thing back in that day. They used to tell you how many transistors it had. You know, if it was a five look, transistor, look that was better than a four it. transistor. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. This is a realistic one. Realistic. That's a, the TRC two one nine three channel. Oh, three what? Three channel. Citizens Band Transceiver, yeah, otherwise known as a uh, walkie talkie, yeah? It's a walkie talkie. Walkie talkie, yep, I think that's bigger than you are, Sagan. Wow, old school, this is a Transair brand, never heard of it. Fantastic, quick two minute teardowns. Oh, Australian, no, just made in Japan. All of this stuff's made in Japan, isn't it, Sagan? Yeah. Marty said that, didn't he? Oh, we're going back to the 70s here. Look what Matt sent in. Realistic 3 watt 3 channel CB Citizens Band transceiver. This was one of the uh, simple models push to talk. Yeah. This is Big Daddy calling Rubber Ducky. The you there, Rubber Ducky? Come back. This one looks a little bit more professional. This is a trans air model, not just a crappy realistic one. But uh, yeah, I've never seen that. There we go. Strain approved. Oh, beautiful. Made in Japan. Oh, excellent. External uh, charger, external antenna, as the other one had. They're very common because you would use these in your, you know, you could plug them into the antenna on your car. So, you know, get a bit more range out of the puppy. I'll tell you what, that's a very early serial number. Beauty. 
And yep, that's exactly what I expected inside a Rat Shack CB radio. Oh, crusty as. Look at this. Oh, Single-sided uh, board to lower the cost, of course. You know, jumper links, discrete wiring everywhere. Very, very typical of uh, 1970s vintage, uh, you know, well, not just Radio Shack construction, but, you know, pretty much anything built back then. Yep. And it looks like all the magic happens inside a couple of single inline packages. There's obviously the uh, output uh, power, the RF uh, power amp for the damn thing. So it's got a little mini heatsink hooked onto it and probably some, uh, you know, some receiver. Meh. And check it. You can, and look, pull your own crystals. There we go. Select your own channels. Bob's your uncle. Oh, I think the battery pack inside this one has seen better days. Look at this. Somebody's taped that together with electrical tape, and it's a little bit crusty. And this one's a little bit more professional, and check out the crystals. Wow, crystals coming out the wazoo. There's the six channel, so that'd be the six channel uh, transmit and six channel receive crystals. And in case you're wondering why they need a separate transmit and separate receive crystals like this, well, I won't go into detail, but uh, because these are uh, super heterodyne uh, receivers, basically what we had, I'll pull one out and the matching, so uh, the matching uh, transmit and receive crystals, and you'll notice that they're actually a, you know, slightly different in frequency, and they're all six of them are going to be slightly different in frequency between the transmit and the receive crystal. And the reason for that is because in the uh, receiver mode, uh, they needed an intermediate, intermediate frequency or IF in the transceiver. So it's going to be running at the intermediate, intermediate frequency lower. Typically, 455 kilohertz was a uh, typical IF. And Look at the difference in frequency. Bingo, 455 kilohertz. And, but you didn't need that for the uh, transmit. You only needed that uh, heterodyne IF for the uh, receive side. And follow the wires from the battery pack and looky what we have here, a genuine homemade bodge. This would not be a factory fit. Well, <laughs> we've got an LM317 down here with some heatsink compound down to the case using it as a heatsink. Then we've got some uh, uh, Vero board here. Unbelievable. Uh, and, oh, is that, is that burnt? I think that puppy's burnt out, is it? Wow, anyway, you got an LM... Oh, that's come off. Is that an LM358? No, that's an LM308. And, yeah, that resistor looks... Yeah, like it's seen better days. So that's a 5 watt jobby and uh, that looks like our output uh, transistors there. But yeah, much better quality. Well, much. It, it is, you know, it's at least a little bit more polished than the uh, realistic one. But yeah, that's, you know, the realistic ones were built down to a price. And this is interesting. Look, they give you a little dummy battery here. I've got nine batteries in there, and that's to be used for when you're using alkaline batteries. So there we go. So you don't want to put in the extra battery. Let's power this puppy up. Let's check out to see if this puppy works. I've got my spectrum analyzer here. I don't have my uh, telescopic rod antenna for it. I'm just misplaced that, so we'll just dangle a wire here. She'll be right. No worries. Let's switch it on. Channel A, which is the only one, who had, only one that had a frequency in it. And, yeah, and, of course, nothing, but let's transmit. Ta-da, there's our carrier, 27.15. And just for kicks, let's see if we can actually receive something. So I put uh, 27.125 megahertz. Once again, just got a, like a, just a flying lead antenna here next to, you know, very near to the other antenna and we're going to put in some modulation as well so we're going to amplitude modulate at uh, one kilohertz so we should be at 10 uh, percent uh, modulation let's see if we can hear it here we go i'll switch on the output so i've got noise at the moment ta-da there's our frequency there's our one kilohertz tone and if we adjust our modulation whoop there we go 10 percent whoa 20 percent modulation you can really there we go, 30 to 40 percent modulation. And you can change the frequency of that too. Beautiful. Wow. 
Winner. So thank you very much, Matt, for sending in this old school citizen band transceiver stuff. End of the world insurance policy right here, folks. When this internet goes down, she'll be right. Yeah. We've got another one from Australia, Sagan. Yeah. Yeah, it's from Melbourne, from Anonymous. Thank you very much, yeah. Anonymous. Hi to all my Anonymous viewers. We went to Melbourne, didn't we? We did go to Melbourne, and what did we ride on in Melbourne? It was, it's like a train, but it's not quite. It's like a train and a bus. Um. A tram. A tram. They were good, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah? They were like trains that went on roads, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look. See what Anonymous has sent. John, it's not Anonymous. Look, no remotes for you. Remotes. Telstra T-Box remotes. In the EY says something for a quick teardown. Took the, they look the same from the front, but they are different internally. Really? Different internally. Uh, maybe they had a design. Oh, yes, the battery cover's different. They probably had a design revision. Oh, yes, that one uses two CR2032 coin cell batteries. This one uses one. And this one has a programming adapter, uh, a programming port on it as well. Daddy, um, do you have the batteries which you need for the remotes? Yep, I do. I think these are television remotes. Television remotes? Well, they're like a television box, yeah? So Telstra is our, if you don't know, Telstra is the Australian... Um, or one of our Australian telecommunication monopolies here, and uh, yeah, and they do their own um, T-Box thing. Yes, I've got one. It doesn't have a remote anything like this. I've got an older one, something like that. I don't know. They're all different. They keep coming out for new designs, don't they? Yeah. Is that a two-minute teardown? Yeah. These two controls might look practically identical, but entirely different models. Check it out. Look at this. Vastly, vastly different. <laughs> I love the little uh, uh, separate uh, uh, RF module here. That's really rather jazzy, isn't it? Um, but yeah, look, they've even changed the type of keypad. This uses uh, tactile domes going down onto the carbon uh, traces down here. This just uses your standard carbon traces with your, you know, just your standard uh, conductive backed uh, rubber sheet there. So really significant differences all around. Why did they do that? I don't know. So not only did they change from uh, single battery to dual battery here, so presumably they've got them uh, in series and required a higher uh, voltage, didn't operate off the lower voltage. Anyway, they've gone from this dip package here. You might be wondering, well, where's the uh, keypad? You know, this thing's the keypad uh, matrix uh, controller. And where's that one? Well, they've got a blob here, so they've saved a bit of cost there. But, you know, in both cases, they've got the um, RF module here, and I'm not sure how they differ, but uh, they certainly are different models. So there you go. Anyone want to take a stab at those? And that's the money shot for those playing along at home. There we go. So thank you very much, John. That's an interesting look at how a company can just change a product. It's clearly designed, it's exactly the same functionality-wise, designed for the same product, the Telstra uh, T-Box, but hey, entirely different implementations. I don't know, did they uh, part go end of life? Did they want to reduce cost? Did something else uh, change in their manufacturing? Eh, who knows? Next up, we've got one from Germany. This one's been here for a long, long time. Sorry, R. Uh, Spitzenfell. You may recognise the name. He's had several sucks of the sap. I think it's Robert, is it? Sorry if it's not. Um, he's had many, many sucks of the sap on Mailbag, I'm sure. That's probably why it's been sitting around for a while. Yeah. Can't have too many sucks of the sap on the Mailbag, can you, Sagan? Yeah. yeah, you can't have too many Mailbag they say. Yeah, all right. Let's see what... It, well, there's got to be something in there. Let's have a look what's on here. Look! Yep, it is, Robert. What is it? Here's a little MP3 player for teardown. The innards are fine, but the battery is 99% dead. Mm, shock horror. Um, yeah, it's one of those little... Is it an eye, is it an eye river? Yes, it's one of those little eye river things. Cute. You can charge from USB port. Yep. And you can probably download too, I'm assuming. Yep, it's a four pin jobby. So it's doing more than just power and ground. It's got to be doing data as well. 
What battery does this one have? Oh, it's a lithium ion custom. Does it need batteries? Yeah, it does, but it uses a custom built in battery, which you can't change. We're going to have to take it apart. Yeah? Yeah. To have a look. Yeah, let's take it apart. Yeah. I don't even know if it, I doubt it even has uh, screws. I think this one's a uh, heat seal on the top. So, yeah, oh no. Look. It just snaps apart, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we can get it apart. Yeah, here we go. Just get it and lift it up. There we go. We're in like Flynn, Sagan. Look at that. We're in like Flynn. Wow, look. You can see it inside. Oh, look, there's a little secret button inside. But anyway, that's going to be a two-minute teardown. I have to get the macro lens and show you. Wow. wow, can you see the chips? Look, there's another one. There's another. There's two buttons. Wow. Ah, oh, you put it back together. Back together. Well done. Now, yeah, Robert says this uh, little iRiver MP3 player was one of the first OLED uh, products for us uh, peons. So, yeah, it's, these were like the Ducks Guts. I think iRiver were like, you know, one of the, lead, if not the leading little mini pocket MP3 player or whatever you want to uh, call them uh, back in the day. So whatever happened to iRiver? But, yeah, everyone wanted an iRiver one. <laughs> And here's the OLED display. Check it out. Look, they've got a uh, dual density, uh, like, you know, two different rows for the uh, flat flex there. So many connections going over. Extremely fine pitch. And that puppy right there is the driver chip. Just flipped right on over. So it's chipped straight on flex. Oh, I'd uh, forgotten how these things work. I think there's a reason that there's four little tactile surface mount buttons there is because when you had the LCD on there, I think you could actually press the sides and they would operate as buttons. That's really quite novel. And there's the culprit. There's the lithium ion uh, battery that Robert says has failed. But, you know, uh, the volumetric packing density in these really is quite amazing. As you can see, you know, vast majority of it is uh, one huge. Is that our memory? Ah, let's take that off there. Is that our big flash memory chip? And that, that's, well, it's a Samsung part, but I see ARM there, if I can get there, there we go, 652 ARM, whatever that means, I might have to Google that puppy, but that looks like a custom uh, system on chip, maybe ARM processor with uh, all the flash memory, I mean, everything's, basically, everything's in there. And there's actually no surprise for finding a Samsung part in this because, it, as it turns out, iRiver was actually formed by a gang of former uh, Samsung employees. So, or directors, you know, key people from Samsung left and formed iRiver. And, yeah, they've been sold to ST, SK Telecom now. Hmm, I won't mention the batterizer. Oh! So thanks, Robert, for this look at the, uh, well, you know, state-of-the-art technology at the time that's now obsolete. Does anyone still use one of these little iRiver MP3 players? Come on, put your hand up. That's a sliding knife, isn't it? It's called a Stanley knife. That's yeah. what they're called here in Australia, because Stanley used to make them. Yeah? Now, people call them a safety knife or a box cutter. They're also called a box cutter as well. I call them a box cutter. Do you? Box cutter. All right, let's use our box cutter to get one. Another one from Germany. Another suck of the sav from Germany. Ah, uh, winnergear.com. It's the Mick Flip. I think it just ripped that one. Just rip it. All right. It's an envelope. Yep, and it's called the Mick Flip. Look. Wow, it's a USB cable. It's one of these ones where it doesn't matter if you, uh, which way around you plug the USB. It works both ways. Whoa, feels pretty good quality, doesn't it? It's about a meter long. Yeah. yeah. But the good thing is that's a micro USB, isn't it? Yeah. And you can actually plug it in either way. And we have the McFlip. Get it? Hmm. Yeah. Right. Anyway, reversible micro USB. 
macro lens time. And that's it. There's all the magic. No doubt pattern penned in. Um, a dual bevel end on there so you can install it either way and the contacts in the center there. So presumably they make contact either way. Either way you put it in. There we go. They go up. Can they actually short out to the top side when you plug it in? That'd be, that'd be my fear. But yeah, the longevity of this thing. We'll also come into question how many mating cycles before it goes tits up. Anyway, looks like they've got an insulator smack between there. So they're obviously, like, because that's not the same contact top and bottom because you've got to swap the pin out when you uh, rotate this thing. So tiny little insulator in there. Oh, tricky. There we go. There's a slightly better... Shot of that. Oh, yeah, that it's a okay, it's a plastic, yeah, sleeve in there, and uh, then they've just got the contacts either side, so that's it's rather interesting. But yeah, I, I don't know about its longevity. Anyone use one of these things, uh, long term? Let us know. We've got some silicon labs, um, ones, I think. These did come in like a parcel and I probably opened them. They're a sensor puck. What's a sensor puck, Sagan? What do you think a sensor puck is? Yeah. It kind of looks like a puck, like a hockey puck. Yeah, it's got a battery in it, Rev 2, on the board, and you flip it over like that, and it's got some sensors on it. Oh, that's a heart rate monitor sensor. Okay, here we go. Look, we turned on. There we go. We turn on, and if I stick my finger on there, it should measure my... Yep, there we go. It's pulsing with my heart rate. Yeah? And it does that using infrared LED, infrared uh, LED and a uh, transceiver. And here's the little sensor puck, and this thing's actually cooler than I thought. It's actually a uh, Bluetooth uh, low-energy uh, gecko. It's got one of these EFM uh, micros on it, formerly uh, gecko, now uh, Silicon Labs uh, low-power transceivers. But they're, they're basically demoing their uh, sensor, this Silicon Lab uh, heart rate sensor and ambient and uh, temperature and humidity and uh, light sensor. And we can hook this thing up to the phone. Check it out. So here we go, we've got it connected, it's a free app that you actually download and we've got temperature, uh, current temperature, don't have my aircon on here, I usually turn it off when I'm shooting video, otherwise uh, you can hear the aircon just, um, it's got UV, what, UV index, hmm, interesting, anyway, ambient uh, light, let me put it further up to the, there we go, that's under the lights now, 1700 lux, so, oh, 2800, look at that, Three, almost 3000 lux, I'm holding that, you know, about half a metre under my uh, big overhead uh, lights here, but on the bench, it's been shadowed. I've got to rearrange the lights here. Being sh uh, shadowed by the uh, camera at the moment. A couple hundred lux. Don't know how accurate that is, but yeah, relative humidity. There's the uh, temperature relative humidity sensor. And if we do the heart rate, look, it automatically detects that my... I'm in there and uh, re reposition finger. Well, I'll give you the finger, okay. Look at that. What a Bobby Dazzler. 48 beats per minute. Am I dead? I've got a reasonably low heart rate. So, whoa, -ee. woo -hoo, It's all over the shop. No, it doesn't like that. No, hello, McFly. But anyway, that is very, very cool. Check these things out. And you can buy these little this little development board with the uh, free app for about uh, thirty US bucks. So worth checking out if you want to, uh, like you know, play around with some uh, you know ambient type uh, sensors and little Bluetooth low energy uh, gecko micro. Fantastic! What a Bobby Dazzler. That's the Liberty Bell, Sagan. That's an American thing. You probably haven't learnt about the Liberty Bell, have you? We don't learn about that sort of stuff here, unless you learn American history or something like that. Yeah. Or unless you watch National Treasure, the movie. We've got another one. You want to open it? Yeah. All right. Yes. We've got one. I think I know what might be in here. Oh, Me goodness. Too. Got the old knife back, by the way. The Mini Champ. That's my everyday carry for those who want to know. So I think someone's it's sent to that crazy Aussie guy. But I think it's just a drop shipper. Oh, dear. 
Another anti-static wristband. But it's a different one. Well, I think it's the same one. What difference? No. I think it's the same one. It's the one with the dodgy thing on the back, the electro scattering time, no. 0 0.1 seconds. Is this work? How does that work? Well, you plug it in. I don't actually... Did I put an ESD bonding point on this bench? I don't think I've done it yet. But you plug this into your ESD bonding point, your grounded bonding point. I've got them on the other benches over there, you see? On the bottom of the benches. Yep. Yeah. And then you put this on your wrist. Yep. Yeah. But anyway, it dissipates all of the static charge on your body. I've done a video on that. So thanks to everyone who's setting something for today's mailbag. Hope you liked it. If you did, you please give it a big thumbs up because that always helps with all the uh, search engine YouTube ranking and all that sort of jazz, you know, interaction. As long as you interaction, even if you put hate comments down there, heh, I'm the winner. There you go. And if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EV blog forum or the blog website. Catch you next time.